All right. Thank you so much for doing this, Wayne. I really appreciate your time. Glad to see you and glad you're doing well. Um, known each other for a while now, a couple years here, a few years. Um, just want to get to know you even more and just like let the listeners get to know you. Uh, can you maybe just um, introduce yourself, maybe a little bit about your background, um, sure. what you do and that sort of thing? Be, be glad to. Um, so I'm Wayne Will Banks. I've I've got a firm that I started back in 1990 called Wilbank Smith and Thomas Asset Management. Uh, we're located here in downtown Norfolk. Uh, we're an investment advisory firm. Uh, we manage about $4.3 billion. Uh, it's a combination of uh, wealthy individuals, uh, nonprofit organizations uh, locally like Westminster Canterbury or something like that. And then uh, uh, we have an office in Roanoke. Uh, we have an office in Raleigh. And uh, we have about 45 employees. And uh, I am a, uh, how, how would I phrase it? I am a son of a uh, Duke University trained doctor. So we were born in Duke Hospital, uh, traveled his academic career around and ended up uh, my formative years in Chicago uh, for about eight years. And then uh, came back down and went to Duke University and then ended up in Norfolk uh, 35 and a half years ago. So that's a, convoluted way of how we got here but uh, um, and just lo love the area love being here love love our business and uh, it's it's a it's a it's a fun, fun place to be what was childhood like for you Wayne were you like picking stocks like as a, as a young man or how did you get yeah yeah actually I I, uh, I got turned on to this because my high school I gotta think back about this he was my high school economics professor was one of the first floor traders on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. That that was the first options that were called stock options. They were started in 1973. So I would have been uh, 15, uh, 15 and a half, something like that. So uh, he kind of taught us all about the markets and we actually started a company to trade stock options when I was 16 with, a, with about three or four of us that all ended up going into the investment business. Ironically, you would think that and so we started trading options and uh, got made some money. And then we went on spring break and came back and all our, all our options were, were worthless. So uh, it was our first foray into the investment world. But I, I got the fever then. I um, spent time, my father, had been, he was a doctor and turned over his stock portfolio to me. And, and I would spend my days at the Merrill Lynch office in Chicago with stock guides. And, you know, I kind of caught the fever. Then I went to Duke and really kind of planned my career at Duke around uh, you, know, you know, doing stock. Uh, I wanted, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up kind of thing. And so, but I, I grew up in a, you know, started out my life in a, as a, as a journeyman. So we lived in Oklahoma city and a little time in New York city at Columbia. And my dad was in the air force and came back. So we, we kind of saw the world, saw the United States. And uh, uh, I had fortunate to have my formative years in Chicago and downtown Chicago, which was just a phenomenal experience. If, if you, You've been to downtown Chicago, everybody loves downtown Chicago. And to actually grow up there was a really exciting, exciting part of my life. Yeah, no, that's good insight to kind of what you do today. What about like your first job or like, what did you do after? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was a big uh, sailboat uh, racer as a kid. So uh, my fa family had a boat and we raced every weekend. And we raced in the wintertime with wetsuits on and when the water was freezing. And and so I, um, I grew up, uh, you know, as uh, that was my summer job too. So I taught sailing school. My first actual job before that was scooping ice cream, I guess, at a Baskin Robbins store in downtown Chicago. But I quickly uh, realized that teaching sailing school was a lot more fun. So as soon as I guess I was able to, you know, be able to have the responsibility of younger kids, that was probably 16. So I taught sailing school in the summers in 16, 17. And then when I got to college, I started, uh, I'd already caught the bug. So I actually started trading out of my dorm room for a Dallas firm. So my sophomore year, I was in Dallas trading uh, commodities. And then my junior year, I was trading commodities in Chicago. And then by that point, I actually interviewed with Smith Barney my senior year. So I was going to school and working at Smith Barney as a stockbroker. And so I kind of, you know, by my second semester senior year, I was, you know, had you know, a couple hours of courses and I'd go into the office and went to work. So I didn't, I mean, I started work right out of school. I didn't, didn't take any time off. So I kind of look back. I wish I'd taken a year off because <laughs> I've been working nonstop ever since. So, uh, but, but, you know, kind of once, once you kind of know what you're going to do, um, 
but uh, but my 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 non business part of my life was sailing. So I raced raced in college, and that was sort of my 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 big hobby. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So you were working at Smith Barney, and you were in school full time, yeah. technically, full-time. and then so like, what was the path like after Smith Barney? Like, yes, yeah, so for Smith, I stayed with Smith Barney for. Uh, from 1982 to 1985, and then met a couple of guys up here that were starting an investment firm, and and they said, hey, come up and you can be a partner in the firm. I was thinking about starting a firm down in North Carolina in Raleigh with a couple of guys that I was doing business. And what I did at Smith Point was a little different. I I immediately caught on to some different trends. I was uh, introducing clients to money managers before that really caught fire in the 80s. So I found a money manager in Raleigh and I dragged him around to, to introduce him to people. So it was kind of the early days of, of the investment consulting business, which is really exploded with EF Hutton back in the 80s. And then I also got into selling corporate cash management programs to companies like back in the day, it was Oakwood Homes and Burlington Industries. And, and so I really took an institutional role in the little office in Durham where I was a quote retail stockbroker, but I was doing institutional work and I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to be on the other side of the street you know the guys picking the stocks and making the decisions and not being on this what they call the sell side I wanted to be on the buy side of the street so so I, I basically formed a company up here uh, that, that later went defunct but uh, it was my first foray into getting to Norfolk that's how I got to Hampton Roads was meeting a couple of guys one was 35 one was 45 I was 25 and so, uh, and then it took me about five years to realize this, you know, this was definitely not, this was not a good combination. I, I picked some bad partners and then it took me about, you know, three or four years to extract myself and form Will Bank Smith and Thomas, which I started when I was 30 in uh, 1990. So you were 30 when you started out, you had a lot of experience under your belt. You know, you've worked at some big firms, you've kind of tasted, you know, know a, a bit of uh you know what you didn't want with the partnership there yeah. like how does one kind of pull oneself back up and decide i still want to do this entrepreneurial path versus you because you could have probably gone to merrill or you know you could have gone to right yeah a firm of the day and kind of been yeah. uh, comfortable you know how did you make that decision well, you know, I, I didn't want to work for anybody else. I, I just, I realized that it was just a couple of bad partners. It wasn't the bad industry. I love the industry, the, the investment advisory business. And so uh, I had some very loyal clients that, uh, that, you know, decided to come with me and help me stand up the firm. We actually started on my kitchen table. Uh, we're there for 30, 45 days and then rented some space from my future partner, Fleet Smith's family's company down in Virginia Beach. And so uh, we rented two little offices, and uh, my first employee is still right across the hall from me here. She's been with me for 30 years, and we're hitting our 30th anniversary together. So it was, you know, at the time, I, w- I was so unhappy where I was that even sitting in my kitchen, you know, trying to run my business on a on a landline phone was was a you know, epiphany. I mean, it was just a euphoric time in my life to be out of a really, really difficult situation. So, uh, you know, I didn't know better. You know, I didn't have much to lose. Uh, you know, I probably started it with ten thousand dollars or whatever. So um, it, we had low overhead. That's the way I like to put it. We had very little overhead. And then deciding my partners was okay. Well, uh, we started off as Will Banks Asset Management for about two years, but the idea would be we bring in uh, Smith, who was my good buddy, a close personal friend here, one of the first guys I met when I came to town, and we bring in Noah Thomas, who was the Thomas of Will Banks Smith and Thomas. He was my father-in-law. And he was a very well-known uh, head of a large trust department down in North Carolina and had a great national reputation. And so for a young 30-year-old, it took me a year or two to convince him to take early retirement. But as soon as we got up to about $100 million, I, I dragged both guys over into the firm and we changed the name in 1992 to, to Will Banks, Smith and Thomas. So I realized it's all about your partnership. It's all about who you pick, who you, you, know, who you go to bed with. And these two guys were people I could trust and I knew them very, very well. And so, uh, it, you know, the rest was history. It was, a, it was a great decision. And so actually I was really helped by learning all the things not to do, <laughs> you know, and all the bad things that I've seen people that were older than me doing that made me realize that 
you know, I, I could do a lot better job than they were doing and, and, and then pick really good partners. So that would be one piece of advice if, you, if you're if you going to go into business, you know, be really careful who your partners are and, and make sure that they, you know, align with your view of the world and your, you know, how, how you want to, how you want to spend your day. And they need to be good people. You know, you want to, you want to make sure they're honest and uh, they work hard and they share your values. So. Yeah, no, that all makes sense to me. It sounds like, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of moving parts too. I mean, talk to me a little bit about like hiring and like your staff, like how did you, uh, like what was like the first, maybe, you know, I don't know, five years, roughly, what was like the first five years like? Did you, did you, uh, did you hire immediately? Did you take some time to hire? Yeah, so, so I, yeah, I, I actually uh, had a, a temporary secretary and then I hired my first employee and then we were able to, we were fortunate enough to be able to rent two little offices inside of a, a big financial institution. So I was able to use their copiers and their conference rooms. And so I was able to look a little bit bigger than I was. And that, that actually, that financial institution uh, gave me a very large account almost early in the game, which was, we managed about $25 million for the, for the, what was a bank basically. So that gave me some street credibility, gave me a chance to brag that I had this big client. Uh, and so, you know, we pretty quickly were able to cobble over, you know, between uh, the two kind of silent partners, my father-in-law and my partner, Fleet Smith, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, get where, more awareness than I would have been as a single 30-year-old guy by myself. So I really had a, this idea of having this silent partnership gave me instant credibility down in North Carolina with, with my father-in-law's. Now, he couldn't compete with his bank, but it was just you know, the fact that they knew that he was uh, supporting me. And then obviously I had this bank kind of supporting me and giving me good referrals. So we were able to quickly put it, get, get up to hundred million. And then we moved to downtown Norfolk uh, to the Bank America building, which I guess was back then it was the- Nations uh, Bank maybe? Nation, it was Nations Bank, it was Nations Bank and got a little, you know, I don't know what it was at the time, 1500 square feet or something. And uh, had some card tables and, you know, kind of got ourselves started and then we hired you know, two or three people. And then I was, uh, I, uh, you know, those guys came in in 92. That was probably, we probably moved downtown in 91. And then they came across in 92. So uh, we pretty quickly got up to, you know, seven or eight people because we had the revenue to pay for that. And, and we were trying to hire really good people like my first employee who's still sitting next to me. Uh, and then the idea would be as we brought what, what later became our partners, uh, bring on guys that you really know well. So my my next two partners, one had worked for Norwood Thomas at the bank, one of his banks that he ran. And then the other partner, uh, you know, that was Carl Turnage and Larry Burner, uh, played football against Fleet Smith, my other partner. So they knew each other growing up. And, and uh, so those two guys joined us in 94. And then the last two partners, uh, the next two partners came on in 2000. One of them worked for Norwood Thomas. And the other one was a friend of, of Fleet's and Larry's from across the street that they knew played soccer against or whatever. So, so it was a kind of a very, um, a very uh, close circle of people that we knew that we trusted. And then Roger Scheffel joined me in 90 in 2006. And he's our fifth partner. Uh, and along the way, uh, Noah had passed away in 2001. Uh, uh, Carl Turner's uh, Larry uh, Fleet retired in 2005. Carl retired in 2015. And so we now have, you know, the same sort of number of people. We just have, you know, grown a lot geometrically in size, but still uh, what we have grown is broadened out a very broad base of portfolio managers. So we probably have 20 people on the investment committee now. So it's a, it's a much more, uh, a little less individually focused and much more of a team and much more of a company now, a brand, that sort of thing. How, how are you spending like your time in those days compared to now? I mean, it seems like in the beginning it would be like sales or like relationships and then in kind of like later on maybe it's um you know it's analysis or maybe it's maybe it's both still like how do you look at um you know it's interesting it's interesting it's still pretty much the same balance of uh you know the company's bigger but i've got a chief operating officer i've got a chief legal counsel i've got a controller so it's, you know, back in the day when we first started, my wife was doing QuickBooks in the, in the kitchen and that lasted for about a year. And then we brought on my longtime CPA to 
uh, to help kind of do the outsourcing of that for a long time. But, but you know, I'm still doing the same amount of stock research, but now I've got five guys helping me do it, you know, but I'm still eagerly, I'm, I'm running those five guys and giving them the ideas and they actually go off and pull the balance sheet of the company or look at the income statement or talk to the company on the phone where I used to do some of that. I now have people that can do that for me, but I'm very, very attached to that process because at the end of the day, if you're not making money for your clients, uh, you're not going to have very happy clients and they're not going to want to stay with you. So, so in each of these cases, I just, uh, have, I mean, I still spend the, you know, my client base has really not grown a whole lot. I mean, I basically have it kind of peaked out many years ago. So I've got sort of the same client base that I've had now for four or five years, but I'll send those new clients over to other partners I have uh, or to my other people on my team that are now grown up. <laughs> they're all grown up and they're just as good at what they do as I am. So they don't need to have me in every meeting anymore. They're much actually in some cases, the clients are happier having the people on my team run their meetings and have me there because sometimes I'm a little too wonky and a little too detail oriented and, and they can see the forest, I'm busy looking at the trees. And so it actually, as time progresses, a lot of my clients are just as comfortable, more comfortable dealing with some of the other portfolio managers in the company than having to deal with me. So, uh, but, but it's, it's a, it's a great business that our, our clients are friends and, you know, we've been, I've got clients I've had for 30 years. And so you start thinking about that and I've watched, I'm dealing with the kids because the parents have passed away or, you know, it's, it's multi-generational now. And, you know, it, it's, I told somebody the other day, I'm, I'm 60, but a lot of my best buddies are 80 and 85 because these are guys that you know trusted me when I was young to you know take on their money when they were 50 and I was 30, and now 30 years later, you know they're in their 80s and, and uh, you know I, you know they're the same guys I I might have hunted or fished or played golf with for all these years. So it's a it's an interesting mix where some of my friends have all their friends are are 50 and 60, mine are you know 70 and 80. Uh, you know, so it's a little bit. I have friends that are 60. I'm not saying I don't have, but I've got a. Really, I got what you're saying. I'm, I've got a very special group of friends that are you know, really close friends of mine that are all you know 20 to 25 years older than I am. So. Yeah. No, that all makes sense. What um, what what is like some of your like? Did you have mentors at a point? Did you kind of have anyone that? Yeah, I mean, I would say some of the some of my mentors would be uh, guys you know, uh, people like you know, Macon Brock. Um, of Dollar Tree stores, uh, David Good, who's you know very close friend of mine. Um, you know, I think uh, you know those are two that kind of pop up as guys I've known for forever, and and I've kind of watched how they you know handle themselves, ran their businesses. Uh, you know, just really high quality. You know, never never an issue. They're incredibly generous. You know, you kind of you can follow just how much. Uh, you know, they, they, those two gentlemen and their families have given to charity in Hampton Roads. I mean, they really kind of put things on the map. So, so those would be two of, two of I would think that were uh, really, really important to me in my in my career. What about like uh, kind of just education and resources? Any like what what what's in uh, what's in your top five of like books? Like like what were some good books that maybe or in your top five of uh just yeah no I, th I think some great books are i'm a big history buff uh i i, I read very slowly because I, I don't have any time to read because i spend my time working but um uh i'd say th i'm just finishing you know i'm on page 645 in hamilton you know i think that's a incredible uh you can go see the play it's great but I, I don't think you even enter the room until you've read hamilton cover to cover and it's a it's a it's a you know powerful statement about what, what we just went through with this election and, you know, how, how evil people can be and, and about, you know, the whole, you know, uh, you know, the whole struggle we have with inequality and, and, and diversity, you know, it was, it, it's a, it's a very eye-opening book that I would urge everyone to read. I think the, the classic treatises on uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, House of Morgan, um, you know, the, the books about the, the, the great Titan, uh, the book about John Rockefeller, I think is required reading for anybody who has any interest in the business and in history, because you, you kind of follow the evolution of Standard Oil and you follow the evolution of the banking system in the United States under uh, you know, J.P. Morgan. And, and it's just a, it's, it's not, you don't even have to be a business guy to enjoy 
reading books like that because you, you know it's just amazing you know kind of what the Rockefeller family did you know later on with Colonial Williamsburg and how that whole thing kind of evolved and, and J.P. Morgan really sprang the banking system as we know it in the United States. So if you start with Hamilton, who invented the United States Treasury, and then you move it all the way through uh, Rockefeller for the industrial side and J.P. Morgan, you know, uh, House of Morgan on the financial side, you pretty much got a history of the United States uh, that I think is pretty pretty interesting. Uh, so so I tend to read more of that stuff and less you know less fiction. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess if you're looking for three books, those are three great books that are uh, ab absolutely mandatory. Yeah, I love that. What's um, talk to me about some stocks in, in the market. You know, what what do, what's your like? What's what's happening right now? What are we seeing? What what do you think? Like, yeah, you know, it's a it's a fascinating time. Um, you know, now that the elections hopefully over, um, and you kind of have some visibility there. I mean, uh, everybody found out that you know the bark wasn't as quite as bad as the as the as the bite. The bite wasn't as bad as the bark, or however that goes. I mean, it, you know, the, this too, you know, transition of power and, and you know, the, maybe the Democrats controlling the White House and the Republicans controlling the Senate. And obviously, the, as you can tell, the stock market loves that, you know, because it gives them, you know, hope hope for the Democrats, but, you know, some you know, less taxes, which which I think we do need to raise taxes. Taxes are corporate taxes, and they never should have cut the tax cut the last time around. That was a, just a boondoggle. Uh, and we need to get tax rates back up to 28 to 30 percent. And we got to get taxes paid by companies that aren't paying because of all the loopholes. But I think from a stock market perspective, uh, my, my, my theme of today is uh, the chumps of this year will be the champs of next year. Uh, you know, the, the, the dogs of this year will be the darlings of next year. So uh, you've seen a little bit of that in the last week or two where, you know, all of a sudden Amazon is dropping and Facebook is dropping and Microsoft's dropping and Town Bank or Bank America are going up. So it's this, what we call value and growth are the two main parts of the stock market. And they've really gotten about as far wide between themselves as they probably have ever been since 2000 with the tech bubble. So, you mm. know, you have, well, I like to call it the 490, 494. So the S&P 500 is up 10% this year. If you take out the six big tech stocks, the fangs or or what do you want to call them? You know, the market is zero or negative two. So you know these these four or five or six stocks completely dominate the indexes. So I would say if I was trying to figure out, well, boy, you know, I want to buy Amazon at thirty three hundred. It, it kind of you know it doesn't mean you sell it if you own it. It's a wonderful company, and I'd probably have it in your forty stock portfolio. But I, I would be looking at the stuff that hasn't moved. So when I look inside of our individual stock portfolio, which is one of the numerous strategies we run, I'm looking at Bank of York Mellon. I'm looking at Berkshire Hathaway. I'm looking at, you know, Prudential Insurance. I'm looking at these things that have been clobbered, but are great companies that just, you know, because of COVID and because everybody's, you know, gone to where the growth is. But if you look at the next 12 months, I mean, I could envision a scenario where Town Bank goes from 19 to 27, which is a pretty good move. That's a 25 to 30% move on your money, while the broad stock market might only do two or 3%. And meanwhile, Amazon goes up and down and up and down, but doesn't really go anywhere. So I would either be looking for the next growth stocks. If you want to stay in growth, don't depend on those top five stocks to think that you're going to make another 100% in Amazon or Microsoft. You know, I think you need to look further down the food chain at small technology and mid technology, you know, where, where's the next Amazon and the next Apple? That's what I ask my guys every week when we get together. It's like, you know, that's great, but where's the next company that's going to turn into an Apple or Amazon that we can make 10 or 15 times on our money. And then on the value side of the equation, you know, we, we're not a big fan of energy, so we don't want to buy any energy stocks. They look cheap, but we think that's a secular problem with the move to clean energy. That it's going to be a real struggle for Exxon and Amazon, but but in the financial sector, there's a ton of stocks in the financial world. You know, from Charles Schwab to Bank of New York Mellon to Prudential. I mean, these stocks are cheap, and boy, mm -hmm. are they undervalued. You know, and they're good companies, and they pay big dividends in some cases. I mean, Prudential Insurance pays a five and a half percent dividend. So mm -hmm. you know, you, you get paid to to wait until it comes back in your favor, and so that's the kind of stuff I would urge. People look at emerging markets, 
small cap, mid cap, none of that stuff's done in nearly as well as large S&P 500 companies. So I would say the message of 21 is look for the stuff that didn't play well in 20 because it may be a leadership change into these new companies for 21. Hmm. Well, that's why uh, we leave that to the professionals there, Wayne. That's, that's, great. Uh, that's a great market insight. I really appreciate your time and for doing this. I know you've got um, some commitments, so I, I really thank you for this. Where can listeners follow you, reach out, get in touch? Where can they um, get in touch with you? You know, probably just, if you go to our website, uh, wstam.com, just Google Wilbank Smith and Thomas Asset Management, and we've got a host of stuff on there. You can uh, just reply to the, the email address on there. We can set you up to get our monthly or every six weeks we do an audio about what's going on in the markets and talk about the things we just talked about. Uh, we have a ton of free stuff on our website about you know market information and indexes and that sort of thing. So you know, just sign up and you'll get put on our free list of stuff. And it's, it's pretty pretty powerful, some of the stuff that we put out. So I would urge anybody, it's, it's free. We don't chase you down if you sign up. Uh, we, don't, we won't solicit you. So it's, uh, it's free and no, no strings attached. So Awesome. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, great to see you, man. Always a pleasure. Uh, thanks. Take care of yourself. Stay healthy. All right. Bye-bye.